Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late. Technical problems. Um, I'm Nicole from Design Lab. I manage career services and partnerships here. And today we have the Canvas design team here to talk about diversity in design. Um, we're going to spend the first part of this talking a little bit about what they do in their backgrounds, what Canvas is. Um, you know, hopefully you, you read a little bit about that. Um, and then we'll dive into questions. So the way this is going to go, hold on a sec. Let me. Um, and mute our notifications. Um, there we go. And the way this is going to work is if you have questions to the right of the chat tab, there's a little questions tab. And I will keep my eye on that. Um, you can do it as we go. We'll do it at the end. Um, and then we get to about halfway through. I'll start reading off some of those questions. Um, hopefully they're related to sort of the backgrounds that we have here and the topic of the webinar. Um, but we're here to entertain all of it. We're here to sort of help you figure out um, how to make your way into design. Uh, so with that, I will start with Gabby, who is the director of product design at Canvas. So maybe she can talk a little bit about what it is they do um, and her background. Hi, everyone. So I'm Gabby. I'm the director of product design at Canvas. And what that means is I support all things design and I manage the three wonderful, very senior level designers here on the call. Just to give a brief introduction about Canvas, we build a product that helps companies improve the diversity in their teams. And that's a two-sided experience. We have one side for job seekers, which we call candidates. And then the other side is for recruiting teams. So the people who review resumes, your LinkedIn, your portfolio, all of that. So we handle both sides of the experience. Um, and in terms of my career, I started the first half of my career in the agency side of the house. So working with a lot of clients at sort of bigger digital studios. And then I moved to the startup space and did a complete 180 and now work in smaller companies with smaller but very fast moving teams. And it looks like there's 92 people on the call right now, which is larger than Canvas currently. So that's really exciting. Um, I will popcorn it to Sarah on the call to give her intro. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a senior product designer at Canvas. I am focused on the recruiter experience. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. Uh, and prior to Canvas, uh, like Gabby, I have a whole host of experiences. I got my career started working in design agencies with big clients like Allstate. And then I moved to very small early stage startup world. Um, worked for a couple of different startups with like less than 20 people. Um, and then I went the full <laughs> other direction and worked at a big Fortune 500 company. I worked at Expedia. Um, and then before that, kind of missed working in smaller startup environments. And so that's uh, kind of what led me to Canvas. And I will popcorn to Courtney. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Courtney. I am a product design lead here at Canvas. I focus solely on the candidate experience here. My path has been kind of similar to Gabby's where I started in web design agency world, working for smaller agencies, but with bigger clients like Apple and David's Bridal and TEDx. And ultimately, uh, once I moved to San Francisco, one of those agencies was acquired by Salesforce. So wound up at a very large IT company, decided that was not quite for me and ended up starting my own startup, which I ran for four years prior to joining Canvas. And honestly, being a founder is really exhausting and just wanted a, a break. So joined the team here at Canvas. And I will popcorn to Edgar. Thanks. Uh, my name is Edgar Vargas. I am a senior product designer at Canvas. I focus primarily on the sourcing side of the product and analytics. And my path in that got me into what I'm doing right now is uh, after going to school for design, I started freelancing because uh, I didn't have the proper paperwork to get a job. And eventually I, I ended up founding a design studio that worked with a lot of startups and bigger companies in the Bay Area like Google and eventually moved from agency side into the uh, very scrappy small team startup uh, in social media, eventually making my way into Canvas because um, a lot of the teams that I was working with were very, very small and I just needed to work with a larger design team. And I got super lucky because I work with a, an amazing uh, set of people here. 
Cool. Well, thank you for introducing yourselves. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to just kind of dive into some questions that, um, you know, I think a lot of our listeners and, and people on the call and, and people who may watch this might have. So a lot of people here are obviously career switchers or students in our program or looking to get into UX design. They don't necessarily have a background in it. Um, so I've heard all of you say, you know, you've gone back and forth between maybe being a founder in a one person shop to really large global, you know, companies. Could you talk a bit about like pros and cons that a more junior person might face in either scenario? Um, again, anybody who wants to talk can, uh, can take that on first. Yeah, I can jump in. I think I've been pretty junior at both big companies and at startups with a really small group. I think some of the pros and cons, um, one of the pros to starting my career working for like a big client, like Allstate at an agency, um, was just that there's a lot of processes to the um, way that they do their design. So I learned a lot about documentation. I learned a lot about working with the big development teams and just sort of how to work with project managers and work in this very formal kind of product design process. And it was really like a boot camp in terms of going from coming from design school to actually working in the industry. Um, but then on the other side, um, some of the cons are that like the work is very slow paced. I was working on projects that were like a year ahead of when they were actually going to go live in the product. So I didn't get a lot of that experience with like testing and seeing how things perform and, and that kind of stuff, which then if you go to a startup, some of the pros there are that you really get to have ownership of your design, even in your, like early in your career, which was really great. Um, you can really make those big high level decisions that I think we all enjoy making as designers rather than just being kind of a small part of a larger team. Um, but then you don't have a lot of those processes. So you're having to figure out a lot of how to do things the right way on your own um, without having you know formal project managers or formal design managers to help you s learn how things are done. So. I think there's definitely pros and cons to both. I think a lot of it also depends on your personal style, what you prefer, what your strengths are right now. Um, but yeah, that's kind of been my experience. I can go next. So um, coming from sort of freelancing and then moving into like a very small, like five people startup uh, company, I think that some of the pros uh, were that you get a chance to really work with all aspects of design. So you get to really build a brand and then eventually figure out like how that translates into the product. So you have ownership of the entire creative uh, process. Um, on the other side, some of the cons that I have uh, ran into is that it is a lot of responsibility when you're the only designer in a small startup because everything that you're building um, runs through you. And so you need to make sure that um, you understand uh, how to launch something. And if, and if you don't really have any prior experience from like, you know, other companies or like even at agency side, it is really up to you to figure out how to do things. So, uh, you know, a lot of like a lot of learning uh, and then like a lot of just painful little roadblocks in the process. But, you know, you get to learn from that as well. Yeah, to kind of echo what Edgar and Sarah shared too, it's like there's no right or wrong answer for where you start out in your career. It's just, it really depends on what you want. I can say from like the smaller design agency world, it was a really great experience because in agencies, you have different teams for the different clients that you're working on. And with that, you're working typically with a higher level designer. So you often get pretty good mentorship there. You also get some insights into kind of how the design agency is run, which is really interesting. However, in agency world, unless it's a really big agency, what I faced was, you know, I could only move up so far. Like the, the highest I could see myself growing there was a senior designer, which, um, you know, just didn't feel like that much at such a small agency. And ultimately, that's why I tried to leave. Um, and then on the flip side, though, when I had worked at Salesforce, 
you know, when you think about the tree of their organization chart, you know, the CEO is up here and there are dozens of people between me and that CEO. And so you can often feel like a cog in the machine. However, it's also a very stable working environment. You know, you're guaranteed a paycheck. You're not worried that the company is going to collapse. You're not worried about like, you know, the company running from month to month. And then as a founder working in a really small stage startup, it can be really great. Like Sarah mentioned, you get to learn a lot of things. Um, Edgar has mentioned this too, like you get to own um, and have that ownership. And that can be really powerful, right, for your career to have that open space where you can grow and be trusted. Um, and honestly, in many cases, just appreciated that you're there to do that work. Plus one to everything. The only thing that I would add is that because I started in the agency side, I had the opportunity to really try a bunch of different things. And if I didn't like a specific project or a specific industry, it was much easier to move rather than when I'm now in house. If I don't like the industry or product I'm working on, I'm going to have to find an entirely new job, which is a lot more effort. And it's just a lot riskier as well. Um, but very glad of you know, where I've been and what I've learned um, and happy to be with Canvas. Thank you all for that, uh, the insights there. Um, kind of moving on to talking about Canvas, what is it about Canvas that got each of you interested? I mean, again, you've, you've all worked at various other places and large and small and global and, and one person. Um, so I'd love to hear like, what is it about Canvas that gets you excited? I can go first. I think something that I have learned over the years that I do really like, it's like solving kind of everyday problems. So like for a long time, I was focused on housing, like how do people find places to rent? And I think what drew me to Canvas was the candidate experience side of that is to kind of reimagine how people search for jobs, especially people who don't have a lot of experience, um, people who have not had the same education opportunities or work opportunities. And I think kind of looking for those mission-driven companies that are doing something like that was really key in my job search. And I think beyond that, the, you know, just the team structure, right? Like being able to work with a couple of designers, but not like dozens of designers and, you know, be able to make that impact was, was really important. Yeah, I think my reasons are pretty similar. Um... I worked for a lot of different companies, like I said, but not not many of them were ever in a space that I was like personally passionate about or personally had a lot of experience with. When I was with Expedia, I was on the business travel side, so it wasn't even like leisure travel that I did very often. So for me, when I was thinking about the next step that I wanted to do in my career, it was really about going somewhere that was a mission that I felt really good about and was something that like Courtney said, is like an everyday problem that I can really relate to and feel passionate about making easier for people every day. Um, and then just beyond that, I think the company size, um, sort of being a startup, so still being really scrappy, but not being the, so small that I couldn't collaborate with other designers or have a growth trajectory um, was really nice too. So um, those were kind of the two main reasons what of what drew me. Plus one on everything that Courtney and Sarah mentioned. Um, I think one of the, the main thing that drew me to Canvas is that uh, the mission really is about uh, fixing diversity in tech. And it's definitely a tool that I could have used when I was younger. So I'm hoping to just design something that someone in my position could use. So that's one of it, uh, one part of it. Um, the other thing is that I really wanted to work with a larger design team uh, at my previous job like we had i think it was like three designers at at max and uh, just coming into a company that has a little bit more process so that i could learn from that and uh keep applying it to my career so it, it, it was part of it was part self-growth and then part believing in the mission uh and the product that we're building For me, aside from the mission, which is just deeply personal, um, I came to the US 10 years ago. I didn't have a network. Um, I was lucky enough to go to art school, which you know not everyone has the opportunity to today. Just felt like 
somewhere where I could actually move the needle for the me 10 years ago um, and the me's that exist today. So that was really important. And I think from a sort of structural and stage of the company, it was really enticing because Canvas was at a point where we had funding, we had some runway. So we are able to try new things and really be experimental and innovative without a lot of the baggage of larger companies that are just built on top of le process and like legacy tech. Um, yeah. Cool, that was, that was great. Um, kind of touching on the idea of um, coming from different backgrounds. Um, a lot of our, again, a lot of people here are probably coming from vastly different backgrounds and experiences. Um, and one of the things that comes up for most of them is this idea of imposter syndrome. Um, when they get into an interview or when they get in their first job, or maybe it's in the job that they're in now. Can you talk through, um, you know, when did you feel imposter syndrome? And maybe it was five years ago, maybe it was yesterday. Um, and how do you kind of coach yourself through that? Because it's, again, it's something that's going to happen, you know, oftentimes in our lives, but um, it's something that a lot of, I think a lot of people here think about. I can go first. Um, <clears throat> so one thing, certainly for me, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but I think imposter, imposter syndrome never really goes away. Um, and the way that I've sort of have learned to deal with it is to expose myself out there and making sure that I'm always trying something new, even if the outcome is going to be, you know, quote unquote, like it could be bad there really is no replacement for experience. So I think the best thing would be to put yourself out there and, you know, just uh, go through the experiences and, and you will learn from that. Yeah, I think for me too, one thing that has really helped is, um, you know, when looking for jobs and just in roles, like really trying to find, um, strong mentors who can really help you see yourself in the way that they see you. So like, I remember at my first job, like I had a manager who, um, I had started off like with a graphic design degree and I wanted to move into UX and I hadn't had much experience with it. And um, the manager at the company was like really encouraging to like help me try out different projects and thought that I like had a knack for it. And so that was, um really helpful so i would say like as you're interviewing and as you're thinking about building your career like don't just think about you know the role think about like are these the people that i want to build relationships with do i feel like they're excited about me and believe in in what i can do um because you know the difference between having a manager who is really going to help you support you and believe in you um and not having one has been huge for me um in terms of how i've been able to grow so Yeah, I mean, definitely for me, I experience imposter syndrome, I think, every day. It's like, I have no yeah. idea what I'm doing. Um, and I think that is going to continue to come up. But honestly, I think one way of combating it or thinking about it is just like you have imposter syndrome because there are so many problems you haven't solved, right? But as you grow in your career, the problems that you have solved will become less, right? There are still problems out there that you have not solved and are not familiar with. But I think you grow you develop imposter syndrome or continue that imposter syndrome for like new things, which is always good, right? That means there's a fear of messing up because you have not tried that thing yet, but that can be really exciting to try something new and figure something out that you haven't before. And to kind of echo what Sarah said, I think when you're looking at companies to work with, I think looking for a place that is like a safe place of learning is really important. At least it was for me. Um, I also found that like fast paced environments were good because usually in those fast paced environments, it's the mentality of like move fast and break things and like people are okay if you break things and like that's okay and that's all a part of the process. And something I've asked in interviews too is kind of how like what happens when things go wrong, right? And you can kind of determine how people feel about mess ups or quote unquote failures and how they help either their mentees or their teammates get through those. Um, I think over time, I've kind of developed the thought of like, you can make uh, quick decisions on things that are reversible, but 
you have to make slow things on things that are not reversible and kind of keeping that in mind too um, can help you, you know, be more confident and, and reduce that imposter syndrome. Same, I have imposter syndrome like every day, even like right before this call. Um, and it doesn't go away. And I think a part of me has, especially looking for jobs, I've kind of just owned it. And I recognize and I speak openly about the areas that I want to improve on, the areas that I'm weaker in. Um, and by doing so, I think it helps me and helps my managers and whoever the leaders are at the company kind of support you in that. Um, it's also been really eye-opening to learn that a lot of executives and people really high up actually have leadership groups and they have executive coaches. And even if they are so much further along in their careers and like manage thousands of people, they still need help from some from time to time. So I think that's a good reminder. And I think tactically too, once you get into your first job, one of my earliest managers taught me to always like take screenshots or have like a running note on your phone of any time you've done something that you're really proud of and on days where you are feeling really shitty and you really have insane amounts of imposter syndrome just review that list and just remember like five years ago I was really proud of this like one web page that I did that now I look back on and I am massively a better designer than that um so that's just a very tactical way, I think. And it's also great for performance reviews. So when you have performance reviews, look at your list. I think that's a great reminder that, again, no matter who you are, you have imposter syndrome. Um, you know, no matter how senior you get, there's already somebody else. And it does mean, to Courtney's point, that like there's just something else to learn. And so, you know, I think as designers, that's kind of what your career is, is to keep learning, keep talking to people, keep iterating, um, including on the job search. Um, so I'd love to kind of move into, you know, this idea of until you get, you know, experience under your belt as a as a sort of newbie applying to UX design jobs or internships or apprenticeships, whatever that is, what are some of the things that you're looking for in a candidate that are not design skills? You know, so if there's somebody has a portfolio, you can clearly see they have some case studies and they can follow the process. What sets somebody apart from another candidate? How, you know, is there something that they can emphasize or talk about? Um, what is important to maybe you know, what happened to you and then what's important maybe for your team? Um, I'll kick this off. I think for our team, something that's really important to me is the ability to tell stories really well. Um, and I think the more senior you get, that becomes increasingly more important, especially because as designers, you are often the voice of the user, the voice, the voice of whoever is experiencing the thing that you're building. And um, in the in sort of the hierarchy of budgets, design often falls into the camp of it's very easy to forget why these people are here and that they don't just make pretty things. So if you can, you know, tell your story either very well verbally or visually in a presentation um, and to just layer that on, especially when you're interviewing, I think can make worlds of difference. And you have to convince people who aren't designers that your work is good. And so where do you build that skill? And that's a lot of practice. Honestly, you just get that through practice. I think too, I also look for just simply how they solve problems, period. I remember seeing this quote, or maybe it was in a podcast somewhere recently. And I think it was Einstein saying like, if he had an hour to solve a problem, he would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes finding the solution. And so it goes to show, right, that like, the thought processes involved in actually finding that solution are so much more about the beginning, right? It's like determining like what exactly you need to build, what are the what is the problem you're trying to solve, and then figuring that out in the end. And early on in my career, um, when I was an intern, my manager had kind of brought up the same thing, right? He was like, as a designer, you start off with like this is your thinking about the problem, and this is like your thing or your solutioning. But as you grow experience as a designer. It's like you're, you think about the project this much and the time you spend to uh, actually design that solution becomes so much less. Yeah, I think another thing too is just um, more than like even design skills, um, I look for like openness to learning and um, like hunger for growth. 
um, you can always learn things on the job. So I always look for people who seem really um, like enthusiastic and are also very like aware of what their strengths and weaknesses are and aren't, you know, sort of trying to make it seem like they can do everything from the get um, and are just really eager for um, learning experiences more than anything. Um, that makes such a difference, um, even just like that attitude than any like hard skills that you have. Um, and just I think as designers too, like being really empathetic and thinking about um, all different kinds of users and scenarios. So if like in an interview, I'm bringing up um, a problem to solve, you know, hearing them talking about you know, not just like the obvious way to go about it, but how could it apply to different types of people and um, being open minded to um, a lot of different solutions makes a big difference. Yeah, I would say very similarly um, uh, experience. I, I really enjoy uh, the way that people present themselves because there's two sides uh, you know, when you're working with someone, there's like, oh, we got to figure this out. We got to tackle this problem. But then there's also like the side that's very human, like you're a human, I'm a human, like let's figure out what we have in common so that we can work together better. Um, a few months ago, we did a routine and I learned that Sarah and I actually, we both did improv when we were in high school. So that was like very refreshing for us to like, know, like, oh, you did improv? I did improv. That was like a very, very cool experience. And yeah, it just kind of helps once you start working with a team uh, to sort of build like a stronger bond. So that's that's really important to me besides the way of thinking and, and the way that you organize things and the way you communicate. Um, yeah, I think that's really helpful too that, yeah, it is more about your willingness to learn, especially as a junior person, like you know that they have not had five years of experience yet, but that's okay. And, and if you can sort of show that I understand what I know, I understand what I don't know, and I'm open to like whatever you're, you're you know, going to teach me. Um, that goes pretty far. Um, I think, you know, another thing that I, I think a lot of um, newer designers think is that even on one design team that you all have the same opinion. You know, so I sort of heard this before. It's, uh, you know, I, I interviewed at one company and they thought this, so everybody may think this. But <laughs> I'd love to hear, you know, on your own team, you know, what does it look like when, when you disagree? Are there things that you know that you're not going to agree about? Um, you know, and how do you, how do you work through that? That's a really tough question um, because I think all of us here know what you know. Each of us will give comments about at some point. Um, for example, I will always say something like, "How how does this fit into like our design system, or like does it break it, or like did you link this to some other person's work?" And I think it, and that's also sort of an effect of where I sit and my role, and I'm not sort of hands to keyboard anymore, so I have more of a balcony level of view. Um, we work through it in a couple of tactical ways. We do have like design reviews every Tuesday and Thursday, and that's usually where we talk through things. I think on a project level, it's also really important to have ownership of, I trust every designer to own their project and everyone can give feedback and everyone can disagree, but it's ultimately up to the designer and who I trust to make the, make the call. You know, five people can say one thing, they think one thing, and as long as they're listening and gathering input and taking it into account sometimes they just have to make a different call and that's fine um, it's similar to what Courtney said before if a decision is reversible then we can just make it and it's kind of a we have a level of risk tolerance I think at Canvas yeah I think we're pretty goal oriented like for each project that we work on we have this like little card that we have in Figma it's like what is the problem we're trying to solve like why are we trying to solve it Who, which specific users is are this is this affecting and I think that really helps shape the feedback because sometimes you know as a designer if you've ever worked with like any form of client you know you'll get feedback you're like this is like not the feedback that i like that i'm looking for like this is irrelevant and so i think that like immediately sets the stage for getting relevant feedback and i think beyond that what gabby mentioned is we all trust each other to get the job done and in a fast-paced startup like if something doesn't go perfectly it's gonna be okay. It's not like we're Apple and we have like one shot to launch an iPhone. Um, so we do have that ability to kind of 
move at our, you know, at the speed that we want and, you know, make mistakes or make judge quick judgment calls that we may change later on. Yeah, and I think like also as a designer, like thinking about how we're all solving problems, like just being humble and not too precious with like your own design decisions. Um, there's always going to be trade-offs between product needs, if things are hard for engineering and don't fit in the timeline, or like if you want to do something that's like outside of the design system and it's a lot easier to just make it consistent. Um, I think just always in your head kind of going back to like what problem am I solving and does this solve the problem rather than like but I think this version like looks nicer or like is like like I don't know just being not too precious with with your designs and and working um having kind of that team mindset kind of helps you mentally um you know take feedback well and and incorporate it um in a thoughtful way beyond just sort of doing what you thought was going to be the best solution. Yeah. <clears throat> also, uh, just to also sort of piggyback on what Courtney said, I think that there's the way that we structure, you know, coming into uh, design critique works very well, really well. Also, one part of that is, is um, getting alignment because we have a small team and we work on different areas of the product making sure that when you come into those feedback sessions, um, there's enough context for people to understand what you're working on so that there's no miscommunication or, um, you know, that we, in, in the little time that we spend uh, critiquing, there's actually hyper-focus on what the problem is and making sure that we don't caught up in like the little details and you've kind of sort of focused like in the larger picture of what we're trying to solve and who we're trying to solve problems for. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, moving over to, you know, some of the questions over here. One of the questions from Samantha is, you know, as a junior designer, like, again, and it can be either at Canvas or other experiences you had, like, what are you looking for in terms of, you know, I think we'll start with like a portfolio. Like when you see a portfolio from a junior designer who maybe from a boot camp or maybe from graphic design um, or, you know, art direction and they want to move into UX, what are, you know, some of the key points where, you think somebody could could really make their story um, different? And again, one of them is probably storytelling. Um, but any other any other tips or tricks you have for anybody here? I think the biggest one is document your process. I don't just want to see final screens. I want to see how you got there. Honestly, like the more the better. So I would rather see like two projects that are really thorough from start to finish of your entire process than like five really clean final products. Yeah, very similar. I, I love sketches. I love just seeing people's sort of train of thought when they're, we have a word <laughs> at Canvas, it's called design, um, where you just spent a minute just sketching something out to try and paint a picture of, of what you're talking about. So uh, I love seeing that, like those little sketches in portfolios. Also things that you tried out that didn't really work and like why they didn't work uh, because who knows, like maybe it could work in the future or maybe you learned something from it that you could apply to something else. Yeah, I think along with those screens too, is right, just like the actual words, like type out text as to what you were thinking, what were the problems you were trying to solve on if it's like each screen or each project, uh, each project as an overview. Also, like if you had the opportunity to work with other people, how did you work with them? What was your role versus their role? Like if you worked with a couple other designers, like who, you know, who did what, how did you split up the work? How did you work together, right? Because those are all the things that if you don't have experience, just having that on your site is one affirmation that like oh yeah like this person does have experience even though they haven't actually you know worked anywhere yet um so for those of you from design lab so i i'm on the career services side of design lab and i get this question all the time and honestly as a hiring manager i can tell when someone's straight out of boot camp like in the first five seconds and what usually gives it away and what makes you 
your portfolio get added to the pile of like all the bootcamp people is if it's obviously templated. There's like one steps one through six and the titles are all the same. And it just says like research, exploration, impact, like kind of like that. And I think what makes your portfolio 10% better is if you realize that hiring managers and design teams are the users of your portfolio. So how do you think about you know, even very small things like using bold or larger text sizes to create hierarchy within your content. It's not just sort of drag and drop of like, here's some sketches and here's a caption. How do you make that different? How do you sort of simplify your portfolio so it doesn't just become paragraphs and paragraphs that no one really has time to read, but instead talk about the highest level things that I just need to know. And if you were giving me a portfolio presentation, what would you, like, how, what would you actually talk about? You wouldn't really spend 30 minutes on research, for example. You'd spend maybe two minutes on that. Yeah, and I think beyond that too, like, rather than it just being a templated version, I would really, I like when pro, uh, portfolios really show someone's personality and their personal design style. Like, sort of think of your website as like an additional design project that is a way to sell who you are. So. Um, whatever you're passionate about highlight that if you're kind of more whimsical you know make it a more whimsical design i want to see um what kind of drives you and, and what you specifically like so don't be afraid to put some personality into it not just make it kind of like a basic template yeah i think too seeing your interests is like maybe underrated like if you're a hiring manager going through like hundreds of portfolios and resumes just like being able to be like oh yeah like I like the one who likes soccer too right like you can start to pick up pieces right because otherwise like you're kind of the same as everybody else like you all have like some sort of design experience whether that's like a boot camp or a work experience so like what else sets you apart is like a really good human or you know something that you're really passionate about because those are all things that can help you make uh just stand out to to kind of be recognized Yeah, I know that this is um, this is like a hot button topic. <laughs> so um, Stephen has one question that I think I'll, I'll sort of um, bring up and then if you have any thoughts. Um, so Stephen is asking, yes, you're all hiring managers. So you see the portfolio and everything, but what about HR and what about recruiting? Um, and my background is in HR. And I think Stephen, it really depends on what company you're applying to because some companies have HR and recruiters who are skilled in design and they can do some of that screening. A lot don't. And so then it's on the hiring manager. Um, so the, the idea of like an applicant tracking system filtering you out, um, you know, that's when the resume comes into play. So yes, you do want, you know, certain key skills, but as a designer, you're going to get hired for your portfolio and not your resume, um, which I think is the opposite of a lot of other jobs. So again, as much as it is important to have a resume that has, you know, all these keywords and all these like buzzwords, um, we're still going to look at your work. Um, so that's going to need to be, you know the most important piece of your your application package. Um, I think, you know, pivoting a little bit into more of like what Canvas does and sort of the mission of Canvas. Um, we had a question from Evelyn a while back. She was asking about diversity. Obviously, diversity is buzzword, um, diversity, inclusion, equity. Um, any tips for what to look for in companies, either that you've worked in or are working with now, now that you're at Canvas? Um, how do you know if they're genuinely like interested in diversity and what that really means versus, you know, what they say it means. Yeah, I think it's pretty easy to spot kind of like boilerplate answers about diversity. And so what I look for is like personal connection to it. I think we've all, no matter what your background is, experienced a feeling of feeling like you are the only person in a room that is like you. So um, whether it's like past jobs or just your own things, I think just hearing a personal connection to it makes a big difference than just like speaking on kind of all the hot talking points that have been going around. Um, and also thinking about diversity beyond like race and gender. Um, you know, we're all diverse in different ways and we're trying to, you know, drive diversity, um, however we can. So, um, kind of going beyond that too is, is a good sign to me. Yeah, I think that's also something that you can just ask if you're speaking to someone about maybe coming in 
for an interview or like in during an interview. Um, I think that uh, companies nowadays are a lot more, I mean, they, they should be publicizing their diversity metrics. Um, it is totally, it, it's something totally normal to talk about now. So if you're unsure, maybe there's like, looking to programs or how they support uh, communities uh, and uh, you know there's if you can't find any information that's when I think it's a good idea to just ask yeah I think you're just looking for like an answer even if the answer is like our diversity isn't great but we're working on it and like these are the ways that we're working on it I think no one should ever feel afraid of asking those questions and if you ask that question and they are offended or, you know, turned off in some way. Like that seems like not the right company for you anyway. That seems more like you deserve better than that company. And so I think, yeah, just like being able to ask, like look at people's LinkedIn profiles who work there and see what they look like and what their paths were and see if they match, you know, who you are, what you're looking for in that company. For those interviewing, a telltale sign for me is who has interviewed me. I have definitely interviewed at companies in tech where everyone who interviewed me was um, a white male who tries to sell me on the fact that they want to be diverse. And then I look at their management and everyone kind of looks homogenous. So I think there's something to be said there as well about trusting your gut and just observing, you know, are they actually what, what we call a canvas walking the walk? Um, you know, I was interviewed when I interviewed for this position by all these designers here. And that told me like, Hey, everyone is different and has a different story. And it's really interesting. Um, and that I think sold me on the job. Kind of, yeah, uh, I think, oh, oh yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, Sarah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say too, I think also like if there is a situation where you feel like there's not a lot of diversity, um, looking to see if the company is honest about that, you know, maybe they are really trying to improve and, um, you know, you could help with those initiatives if that's something you're interested in. But um, I think like Gabby, you have situations where you only talk to white men, but then they kind of talk like, oh, you know, we're fine. We have like, you know, a couple women at the office or whatever it is. Um, but if they're open-minded, um, and really trying to work on it and that's something you're interested in kind of helping drive that could be an interesting thing too i think that's a good point just um that you all brought up about specifically courtney and edgar are the idea that in an interview you're supposed to ask questions too and i think that's something that a lot of you know more junior people are afraid to do or they just they have no idea what to ask they're just going to sit there and, and you know they expect it to be more of like an interrogation type type interview um do you have any ideas like what would be good interview questions that you would want a junior to ask you? Um, you know, what if somebody asked you, you'd be like, wow, that's a great question. Um, I love when people ask me, what is the biggest risk um, to the business? I think that's a really interesting question because it tells me that designers are thinking not just about design, but like the company and the product and like the business as a whole. And like, what are the various areas that all feed into design at some point. I also like when someone asks me, what's the hardest part of your job? Um, because I ask that all the time and it tells me so much about the culture and the politics and maybe what are some um, areas that I'm gonna just have to be more aware of when I start. Is it, you know, maybe lack of resources in one area? Is it sort of difficulty speaking to certain stakeholders if you're if they're sort of from different backgrounds? Um, and that just tells me that someone's very, very intuitive. Yeah, I think asking also why that person joined that company or like came to that role because it can kind of give you a notice to like are you on that same head? Like, do you have that same headspace, right? And I think even just asking about the projects maybe they're most proud of or just their most recent projects, because then you can start to determine too, like, is this on par with what I want? Like, do I want to be working on a single icon for months that you might do at Google or are they shipping stuff every single week, right? And like being able to get a better sense of that is, um, I think, pretty crucial in an interview. Yeah, and I think I'll be on that too. I always like to ask, you know, why they joined and then also um, 
how it's met their expectations or how it's maybe been different than what they expected. Um, I think you get some really honest answers out of that question. Um, and you can really see not just like what they're selling to you, but like what the experience is actually like. Um, and I appreciate the chance to kind of get more um, candid and yeah, you get some of those more of the challenges as well as the positives um, when you kind of dig in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely all of that. I, I think the question that I really like, uh, enjoy getting is uh, are like besides the work that you're doing, like what other areas of, of you know, learning and growth opportunity are at the company? Um, something that we do at Canvas are lunch and learns so that you get to see other, you know, what other people are working on, like maybe um, parts of the company that you would have never reached out to, you know, people are more than happy to share their knowledge. So, and that is really important. And also, um, how can you participate in areas outside of what you do on a day to day basis, because it allows you to understand other aspects of the company that are still related to the product. And that could also help you grow, learn and feed your work at the same time. Cool. Thank you. Um, talking about like, you know, landing your first job and then your second and then moving on as, as some of you have done. Um, ben has a question about like updating and updating, editing your portfolio. So I think, you know, some of our students, especially coming out of a boot camp, you know, you have this feeling of like, yeah, I did it. Now I'm done. Um, <laughs> where I think as a designer, you'll be doing it for the rest of your life. So do you have any tricks on or like, how do you go about making sure that like you're keeping track of your work? and that your portfolio is like a living thing and not just like a static thing in time you did 10 years ago. My best piece of advice is keep your por portfolio updated while you're not looking for a job because um, the more senior you get and as you sort of build a network and build community and you meet other people and work with other people, you never know when an opportunity comes knocking and it is always the most stressful when you have an interview and you haven't updated your portfolio in like three years because it's just gonna take so long to do. And so what I do is I honestly just have really good file management and I keep things on like a Google Drive. I usually like to spend any sort of holidays like maybe the upcoming winter break and just spend like a couple hours a day just updating things, dragging them in. It doesn't have to be perfect because you can always edit that later, but just having it all in one place and doing it in a non you know high pressure way has just worked for me throughout the years yeah and i would say like as you're working in a role um and you complete a project that you feel good about um just making sure that you're saving documentation that you would like to use in a portfolio onto like a personal drive or something like that as long as you have permission to use it or whatever it may be um, but saving that along the way is going to make it a lot easier, even if you don't update the portfolio itself right away, you can at least have everything. Um, so I would just keep that in mind if there's something that you've accomplished um, to document it at the time you finish it. Also, one addition to that is, yeah, if there's any like business things that come out of that, this is like when you actually have experience, right? But like three months down the road, if this like had an impact on revenue or had like a really good conversion. I think adding those numbers in is something I did not do as an early stage designer. It's also like quite hard to do if you work in agencies, but if you work in-house and have access to those numbers, those become really powerful for you when you're talking to potential employers. Yeah, something that I think it's also, I, I think it's really just cool and I, I think I, I wish I would have done it when I was, you know, uh, like earlier in my career is try to set time apart to design something for fun. If you don't have enough work coming in, it's really hard to build it up, build up a portfolio, but if, but it's a lot easier to take something that you notice out in the world or something that a project, like a, like a, like a side project that you've been thinking about and spend a little bit of time thinking about that and, and try and figure out like, how can you apply the design thinking in, into that uh, that that problem or that project that, that you've given yourself? Cool. Um, we got a couple more minutes, so maybe I'll ask like two more two more questions here. Um, you know, you've all been designers for for yeah some amount of time now. What is it that you're excited about? 
um, you know, what, what is it you're excited about in the next like year or so, because we're wrapping up a year, um, either in design or technology or, you know, in the DEI space since that's where Canvas is. Um, what am I excited about? I'm excited. I'm just going to like babble, but, um, I'm excited that, um, a lot of people have taken the pandemic to kind of reevaluate their careers and kind of work for missions and companies that are more meaningful. And even in like a boot camp way, a lot of people have said, you know, this is where I pursue kind of like my passions or what I've, I've always been interested in and and design and UX design, product design, it's become a lot more accessible for people. Um, when I started design and I was in art school, that was kind of the only sort of easy way to get in it. And even then it was, you know, very, very expensive and not really, you know, accessible for most people. And now we have a lot of programs that are doing that. And I've seen so many great designers come out of boot camps like Design Lab. I'm also really excited in the space in general that people are investing in it um, and not to toot the canvas horn, but we are seeing a lot of different companies start to invest and put their money where their mouth is in terms of um, investing in diversity, inclusion programs, all of that. And I'm seeing it happen more and more. It's not gonna be easy and it's not always sort of like a straight line, but for the first time in my career, I'm actually seeing people put money um, in something that really matters. Yeah, that's what I was going to say I'm excited about. I think I'm excited to see tech, hopefully, I think it will transform out of being, you know, a white male kind of boys club industry. Um, and I think the commitment to diversity and inclusion we've seen at Canvas, like talking to different companies, um, is really real. And it's not just lip service. Um, and so how that's going to transform our industry and help us solve better problems and do things that we can't even imagine yet, I think is going to be really exciting. So um, I'm just excited to see more diverse people um, in the in the tech space. To add on to that too, I'm excited just to see the number of positions open for designers, right? It's like, I would have never expected this when I graduated from college, you know, however many years ago. But now, I mean, you just scroll through LinkedIn and it can feel really overwhelming, right? If you're not hearing back, but I think that the really positive part is that there are so many design jobs and they're not going away, right? It's like more and more, com more and more companies are tech companies and all of these startups are popping up. And that just means so many opportunities for us. Um, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely plus one uh, with everything that was said. Uh, something that I'm really excited about is that uh, design, like Courtney said, is not going away anytime soon. But also there's so many industries that are now looking at tech and they're understanding the value of design. So even if you don't end up in tech, you can work in a different industry still doing design. That's that's really cool to me. Um, and then on in the topic of diversity, I'm really excited to see how uh, just different mindsets shape products and, and just the design industry in general. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we had skew morphism, for example, was like a design practice where you use a lot of gradients and make things look like they're actual real things. And then the, the industry evolved into like, oh, let's make things minimal. So like, I'm just really excited to see like, what's gonna be the next best thing that people start to experiment with so yeah the future i'm excited for the future cool um well i think we're gonna wrap up there um can can people on this call follow you on linkedin <laughs> and add you um you know i think that'd be great we'd be happy to do it um i don't know if you have any last words um you know but Thank you so much for doing this, uh, Canvas team. Thank you, everybody here, for, for joining us today. Um, and have a happy holiday. Thank, Thank you. Guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye.